I'm happy that you're here. My name is Markus Beckedahl. I run the blog netspolitik.org. And tonight we have four different talks here following one another. I'm going to start off with an introduction about the most important central political questions regarding digitization, what we call Netzpolitik. After that, Anna Wieseli from our editing team will talk about uh, privacy and surveillance. And then Gillian York from the Electronic Frontier Foundation will talk about privatized public, um, privatization of the public sphere, Facebook and censorship through private companies. And then in the end, Jeremy Zimmermann from La Cotta du Net from France will talk about hacking with care. That's more about how to uh, prevent burnout for activists. Everything from relaxation exercises for screen workers to burnout prevention strategies fitting the evening time. So I'm from netspolitik.org. This is a part of our um, editorial team. We've grown a bit since then. Last year we had a little um, issue with the German Office for the Protection of the Constitution, but now we're getting more and more uh, support from people. And our task is to actually look at what politics and politicians, but also uh, other people are doing in this space. So normally I do this on my own laptop so I can see the next slides. Um, right now I only know I have 80 slides, but I don't exactly know which one is coming up next. So. Yeah, please bear with me when I'm playing PowerPoint karaoke. <laughs> so the next slide I know, the, the first topic is about Edward Snowden and the debate that he started. Netspolitik.org exists in 2002. And if you look at the first 10 years, we haven't really talked about it, or at least not outside of our blog, um, how secret services would work if they wanted to surveil everything they can outside of democratic control because we were worried that we would be put in the corner of conspiracy theorists because many couldn't imagine what is being surveilled and they couldn't imagine that everything is actually under surveillance until in summer 2013 Edward Snowden came forward and handed a trove of documents to journalists and thus uncovered the biggest surveillance scandal in history of mankind. <laughs> a core part of these uh, discoveries is the NSA. Here you can see the headquarter in Maryland in the USA. The NSA has started after the Second World War and especially after September 11 to create a global surveillance network where as Snowden has revealed, all Western secret services were included and together in a, in a in a ring, in a network, they surveil everything possible. In the name of security, they are creating massive insecurity through all the hacking strategies. We learned that you can not trust any of the uh, large American platforms that most of us probably use. The PRISM program is one of the cheapest programs of the NSA. It's only $20 million per year and gives them access, root access to uh, the databases of Apple, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Yahoo, Google, and, and so on. In uh, Germany in 2013, uh, it was an election phase and the, the German government was trying to explain, well, the debate is over. At that time, we still had a minister of the interior called Friedrich. Um, a few might remember you. Also, we had a uh, minister of the office of the chancellor called Profala. And well, we were all laughing about him because it was clear that no, the affair is not actually over. There's much more behind that. No problem. And the long term is that they were actually right. For them, the affair was over and they knew that in the long term, for most of the population, this scandal actually was without any consequence. But at this time, we can identify four reforms post-Snowden that I will get to in a second. 
There's been exactly one week of protestations against the NSA surveillance. That was in October 2013 when it was revealed that Angela Merkel's party cell phone was uh, under surveillance by the NSA. So it's not about the chancellor's cell phone, but about the one that she got from her party. And it's it's basically a private phone. And that actually made all the hardliners from the CSU go up in rage that um, the chancellor was, was being wiretapped. So then there was talk about a no-spy agreement that in the end only Angela Merkel got. And Obama gladly gave that to Angela because, well, if they stop wiretapping Angela Merkel's cell phone, they can just tap every other, everybody else's cell phone and they still know what everybody's talking about. So let's look at the four reforms we've seen since Snowden's revelations. Last year in summer, the... Um, the German Secret Service strategy was leaked by us. They get 300 million to increase the surveillance structures available for um, the internet exchange points, to buy zero days, to buy um, state trojans, and to create a biometric infrastructure. The Office for the Protection of the Constitution gets more resources for um, dragnet phishing and social networks to survey the internet and also exchange more data with other secret services. When we revealed that, we actually uh, were investigated for um, we were investigated by the, by the German state. Uh, that was dropped later, but you can see some of these consequences that transparency brings. So, why don't they actually um, why don't I actually clear any of this up? There's actually a commission instituted that was supposed to deal with the NSA revelations. And this commission has been working for two years and they rather quickly re uh, realized that they needed to talk about the own secret services because what uh, Pofala and, and Merkel said after the start of Snowden revelations, that this is a problem focused only on the US and there's nothing we can do and nothing we need to do, that is not true as this commission has shown. So we can be happy, uh, we should be happy that we have a small opposition that is in the Bundestag, only 20% actually, and they, and this is all of them in the picture. So this one from the Green Party, one from the Left Party, and plus uh, one replacement each. So they get to ask one question per turn. So you have 100% question time, and 19% and of that might uh, might be used by the opposition. And these are the good questions. In between, there's always the, the ruling party, the CDU. They have to ask something with their 50-something percent because it's expected of them. And then it's always the time where everybody else goes out and goes use the bathroom because, you know, when the CDU starts asking the questions, you don't really need to listen in. But all of that, everything they've now determined to be illegal by the Secret Service is now being legalized. With the new BND law that was passed by the cabinet la uh, yesterday, and will be going to the Bundestag next week and shall then be enacted right after the summer break. That actually even expands the current surveillance. So it doesn't just legitimize what the Secret Service has done so far, but it actually extends their privileges uh, for internet surveillance. And this is exactly the, the wrong way to go. The fourth reform you might have come across uh, on the name of the Vorratsdatenspeicherung, the data retention policy, and that saves who is communicating with whom, when, and also where your cell phone was. So not just when it rang, but also when it's a smartphone. Because smartphones usually every two to three minutes send data home and say, hey, is the new data? I don't know, Facebook messages, you know, background refresh. And so on average, the uh, position of your smartphone gets updated every two to three minutes on average for a minimum of four weeks. 
the connection data, who you phoned with, uh, who you sent messages for 10 weeks, and the content of the messages are also saved completely. This is not just about connection information, it's also about content. And based on these connection data and this, this metadata, you can often find out more about you than if you just looked at the content. So it always sounds so not a big deal if, if you just know who talked with whom and if you know who you were. But if you know where you've been the past four weeks using statistics and algorithms, you can actually know better where you will be tomorrow than you yourself know. So many people don't realize that. This location data is also used for so-called uh, cell phone queries, uh, cell register queries. And last year we actually checked in Berlin, there were hundreds of cases of these requests. So cars were burning, police was convinced that there must be a uh, radical left background. And by looking at uh, the files of one suspect, we have stumbled upon the fact that Every time when the car was burning, police actually called up all the cell phone providers and asked them for all the data of all subscribers that were anywhere close to this um, mobile cell. So we visualized that data and it, it turned out that, well, if you live in Kreuzberg or Friedrichshain, any of these areas, then you're always a suspect, you're always in this dragnet surveillance. And then... In the end, it turned out that uh, there was no radical left background at all. It was just a pyromaniac and he didn't even have a cell phone. But this led to a uh, starting a discussion whether the police can just call a provider up and get all the data and thus track and, and suspect all of these people that were or are in this uh, cell. And th the problem is that parts of the government thought this was completely legitimate and the opposition is, well, the opposition. So here's another example what you can do with uh, location information. Malte Spitz, a politician from the Green Party, actually managed to get to the data that was saved about him and, and the data retention law, and he visualized that. So this is where he was over the last half year, and this is basically the rail network in Germany. The, the dot on the top right is Berlin, on the west is Münster, where he comes from, then there's Bonn, Frankfurt. And you can easily map this on, on the map of Germany. You can even visualize this better. So the question is, and this actually says my notes in there. So the basic question is, why do we allow something that in the non-digital world would lead to revolution? I think the generation of our parents would march on the streets if the data was saved who they talk with when uh, in their garden, which neighbor they talk with, who they talk with uh, in, in the pub or over coffee. But this is exactly the kind of data that is saved in the digital data retention policy. And there's almost no protest against it because most people don't realize that these data are collected. Also, most people don't realize what kind of traces we leave behind. So most people are happy if they know how to use their smartphone but they don't really uh, look at what the consequences of that are. And that's just one of the many questions we have to answer right now. I hope that, again, the, the European Constitutional Court or the German Constitutional Court will actually bury the, the law that's going to be enacted again. But how do we handle that right now? One possibility is to uh, try and resist politically. But you, as we can see, that that uh, the CDU is probably going to remain in government for the most part of the future because mostly uh, all the people are voting. So there isn't really much hope um, for politics in the short term. Of course, you can you can sue them, um, but that takes a long time, and you have to go through all the surveillance laws one by one. So most people actually put their hope in technology, and with technology, you can right now put the most stones in, in the path of the surveillance state. It's getting easier and easier to encrypt your emails. It's uh, better and better. Messenger, um, like Threema, if you want to, if you want it easy, it's not 100% secure, but better than WhatsApp. Signal, if you want to be even more um, more secure. And you can hide your, your traces on the web if you're using the Tor browser on the Tor network. So that means your internet connection will be slower, but 
it's not so easy to to track you and to save what you looked at and when. Another possibility is to work more on decentralization. The surveying the internet is possible mostly because the internet becomes more and more centralized and concentrated in the hands of fewer and fewer companies. And that's a problem. And one possible counter strategy is to decentralize and use local networks like, for example, Freifunk. Um, in many cities, there's many people who are starting to share their Wi-Fi, who are starting to build antennas, starting to network with each other and mesh up. So that's just one of the many initiatives that gives us hope that a counter strategy will be possible. Something else that we keep asking ourselves is where are these kinds of campaigns from the government um, don't use surveillance? From, from the 80s, we had don't give AIDS a chance and they told people about um, contraceptives and barriers. But with surveillance, it would be the task of the government to try to prevent, uh, to, to try to protect our um, constitutional rights, but to actually do the opposite because parts of the government actually want to surveil everything in the name of security. But that is just the beginning. If you look at this entire data privacy debate, it's not just state actors we're dealing with here, it's also private actors. This is Mario Sixtus from The Electric Reporter. And uh, about half a year ago, he created an interesting mockumentary for Arte, a German TV channel. What does it mean if we always run around with cameras in the future, especially cameras with augmented reality and face recognition? It's, it seems like a great... Uh, great idea. Here in the festival, I'd like to have a camera so I can I can see who I should better not talk to, maybe who who could be interesting to talk to. And the problem, of course, is I don't want others to be able to recognize me through that, because of course I want to remain private and and uh, just walk around here without everybody recording and tracing and everybody knowing who I am. So you get into this dilemma that we want answers how to solve this dilemma because this technology already exists it just hasn't rolled out in the breadth to the public yet but it already works and it's just a question of time until lots of people run around with these kinds of cameras tapped to their face and have a lot of access to this um, face recognition so the first people who will profit will be facebook and google and and others they already have a the, the, the data to identify everybody based on camera pictures, especially with the people who are tagged in photos, so they already know who's who. Police and secret services can probably do that too. The question is how long does it take until every Joe Schmo can do that on the streets? And do we want that? Um, and also can we prevent that? Do we want to prevent that? Yes, anyway, we don't really have a good answer to that yet. Then there are a few counter strategies um, since I, I wear glasses myself, I know it's kind of uncool to, to run around with LEDs in your glasses, but this actually prevents facial detection. And all these counter strategies so far originate from the art world. Then there is a way to use certain materials for burkas, also not culturally, societally accepted, um, especially in many areas in Eastern Germany. This, this is probably going to trigger some issues, but it is a possibility to prevent um, facial recognition. Then also you can wear makeup. It's it's also not culturally accepted, especially not for men. And also if you if you make a small mistake, uh, you will still be recognized what you look like. Uh, you look silly. So another challenge that we're facing is there's more and more devices containing microphones. And Again, this this makes sense. Uh, since I was small, many people here probably also grew up with Star Trek. We're waiting for the day when um, the food just comes out of the microwave and you tap a button and all the computers actually talk with you without you having to use a keyboard. And Mattel just uh, released the first version of Hello Barbie. And this is a Barbie that listens to the children and is marketed as... In a way that, that as parents, you can actually download the sound recordings from the Mattel website. Uh, so the problem is if Mattel can listen in, then who can guarantee that not that, that somebody else can just hack in there and, and 
listen into well so what do these uh, children speak about with their barbies now, this is a very simple example but imagine you buy a coffee maker with a microphone super practical if you can just uh, shout from the bed say hey you just my coffee but who else might be listening in and how safe is an operating system running on a coffee maker at all And how often does it get updated, especially if you buy a coffee maker and then you use it for 10, 15 years, um, as people would normally do when, when you regularly delime it. Also, in cell phones, smartphones, Siri and so on, uh, I would love to use this. I hate using keyboards. I would love to just talk to my computer. But I'm a little afraid that all computers are always listening in at the moment because nobody can guarantee that somebody else actually It's also listening. And then there is a meme on the internet. The Internet of Things is when the toaster mines bitcoins to pay off its gambling debts to the fridge. So this, explain, this explains this dilemma. Coming in with the Internet of Things, we have a, a whole digitized uh, scenery that we inhabit that bring you a practical aspect but the to but the but toaster looks like a toaster a computer the computer inside is unknown to us we we cannot see this let's get to another point here please a debate that is not acknowledged by the general pub public society is the case of net neutrality This is a picture of the internet. Everybody thinks it's a one internet, but the internet's actually a network of networks. So this is due to some visionary people who 35 years ago oh, made this design decision to develop the protocols that the, that the intelligence of the networks has to have to be brought to the ends of these networks. And these networks have to connect to each other. And end users, we at the end point uh, that we can, as end users, can choose which protocols, which services we use on the other side of the networks without someone in the middle telling you what you can use and what you can't use, without telling you to download small, uh, slower or faster. And that's a big difference to every other media form that existed. For example, TV, radio, or papers, you need some form of distribu distribution or frequency. You need a lot of money. In the internet, all you need is creativity, your own blog, and then things can come out like our blog, Netspolitik.org, or Wikipedia, or Facebook, or whatsoever, because you have asked nobody for to allow you what you want to do. This end-to-end -end principle is in danger. This net neutrality principle is in danger, because now we have new technologies that being installed in central nodes that don't, that can not only uh, look at the data stream, but they can also look at the quality um, of the data, and then they can change the speed, so-called deep packet inspections, and then they can uh, reroute the traffic and give you access or can deny you access. For example, for example, this is used in China to keep off the Dalai Lama of the internet in China. In, in Germany it is used to uh, get Skype off T-Mobile's uh, mobile network in Germany because Skype was a former, it was former competition to T-Mobile. They didn't want uh, Skype to use the data. So uh, the just every second data packet got dropped by the telecom to make Skype use impossible on their network. But what you can actually do, you can create a fast lane. Um, and this fast lane can, you can sell to your customers and the rest who doesn't buy a fast lane um, can be outsourced. 
So the German government recognized this really quick and Angela Merkel declared and there shouldn't be an internet of a first class or a second class and we shouldn't have a two-tier system concerning so what we are actually telling is uh, natural internet without net neutrality is like a bench where you can't sit on. And the old net neutrality debate was mainly about uh, mobile providers excluding you from certain services. You probably didn't read your terms of services. If you would read them, with a high probability you would find in 60 to 70, you would find clauses that would forbid peer-to-peer -peer communications or chats, so like Skype or, for example, WhatsApp. And we try to find out what this means. Uh, what does it mean? Peer-to-peer uh, -peer communication is not allowed on the networks of Vodafone or Telecom. And in the support forums they would declare would uh, tell you that this means a computer-to-computer -computer connections that would be denied the services but in the TOS they would deny you this right even though obviously every other connection would be a computer computer connection this is the old debate and they've learned that these fast lanes have become much more profitable than just trying to keep the competition out of the systems so we had this German debate we called Drosselcom where they were slowing slowing down flat rate uh, on your home line internet access and put in a volume tariff based on a gigabyte per month. For example, 300 megabytes per, per month on your mobile contract, so your internet will be slower after half a month. And so the German Telecom had the brilliant idea um, that they can use the telecom and their partner services with the same speed and they would just slow down the other services. For example, we have seen this with the Spotify, which is also a partner with Georgia Telecom. So without uh, taking a look at your data volume, you can stream music from Spotify all the time. That's perfect for Spotify. That is perfect for Deutsche Telekom. And in the short term, it's also perfect for everybody using the service. But over long term, that's bad for everybody because competition would not be allowed the same quality of service or the same speed of service. For example, we have an audio podcast on our site, Netspolitik.org, and that's not that's not so different from a streaming service like Spotify, but we couldn't get a, a special deal like Spotify because we are a much smaller organization and we don't have the special relationship with Deutsche Telekom. So this is just to explain what uh, happens if a regime like this is installed. Also, um, the German government doesn't think this is a problem. The problem would only exist if if glass, glass fiber would be rolled out nationally. The problem is we don't have glass fiber, so the problem is actually the other way around. Because if you actually have glass fiber connections, you don't have to talk about uh, slow and fast lanes, but you could provide everybody with extra fast internet. So this problem of pseudo neutrality wouldn't even exist. Our special problem is that Günther Oettinger our, has been sent to Brussels as our man in Brussels and Günther Ausnäger and he was he was in charge for the net neutrality reform and it wasn't a, he told people this is not about Spotify and stuff like this this is about cars there's super funny examples for example there is a car and somebody is uh, horn, honking behind him and they crash into each other because of this. And this sounds super. And I understand this is how uh, lobbyists uh, have explained him. But actually, if you ask um, car manufacturers, this wouldn't work because uh, otherwise the cars would crash into each other if this would go over a central network because they would use uh, decentralized peer-to-peer -peer networks. But if you look at, for example, 
comments from Angela Merkel, net neutrality has to be abolished because cars would crash into other. So we've made a quiz and we have matched the, the statements from Merkel and Oettinger uh, with uh, the heads of the big telecom companies and they've basically told the same story over and over again without any much difference. Now all the car manufacturers tell you, oh, we don't even need internet for car-to-car -car communication and this is uh, kind of a pseudo-debate. Uh, last year, the EU Parliament in so-called Trilog with Gutterting and other stakeholders put in place a, a declaration. Since then, we have a lot of uncertainty what has actually been uh, written down in this declaration. So now uh, German, the German Net Agency and other and other regulation agencies are working out the finer details and they're bringing together um, persons, civil persons and also uh, companies to <laughs> just get a grip on this problem. Maybe you still remember safetyinternet.eu that uh, brought this topic that sometimes is a little bit strange, a little bit difficult, sometimes even boring uh, into uh, the public sphere. Uh, until now around 50,000 people have have taken part in this discussion. Uh, this we've, We have seen s similar discussions in India and the EU. Uh, they have used also comedians, but we only have the internet so far. So the third topic now. Uh, so one of the biggest debates is regarding copyright and um, I personally think that is one of the most boring and, and complicated topics. Even if you actually study law, you're still not quite sure what, you, what you're allowed to do. So the, the German Government Center for Political um, Education, is they released a, a booklet of 400 pages outlining what you need to know to be active as a producer on the internet. And it made sense way back when only professional players were publishing and using professional infrastructure, so artists, musicians, filmmakers and so on, because they would usually have their professional lawyers in place that can then deal with each other. But then suddenly everybody became a producer and a sender and everybody gets in touch with the copyright law, which is still um, based on, on a time before the internet even existed, where people existed, where people thought maybe, well, everybody will have cable TV. So, yeah. Then also some ministers had, had problems with the copyright law, like this uh, former minister in Germany. So I tried to think back, when was my first copyright violation? When I was looking um, into the, the whole topic, when, when Napster came up and people were starting started being called pirates and I realized I was probably about six or seven years old in kindergarten or at school when we made uh, collages um, you maybe you've done this too um, you cut out pictures from uh, magazines from from uh, newspapers and then you paste them together all legal thanks to the right for private copying that's why you pay a certain fee when you when you buy new media but then we actually put these collages up and putting them up makes it to a public um, a public performance. So when more than seven people see something, you actually have to talk to all the rights holders, photographers, if you're actually allowed to do that. Of course, nobody did this because there were no lawyers going through the schools checking uh, who they can Saporina and sue. But today we have the problem that these kind of uh, collages and mashups and remixes and YouTube videos are now being published on the internet. And that can be crawled automatically, identified automatically, and you can even send subpoenas automatically with invoices up to thousands of euros because you did not ask one of the copyright holders for their permission. So if you're being creative and you're trying to practice this, this uh, media competency, try to reach all the different rights holders and figure out if you are allowed to use something. If you even get an answer in the first place, then it's usually a high uh, bill. 
attached. So it doesn't really make sense to use this for non-commercial purposes. And the problem again with copyright law is that everything that's not explicitly allowed is forbidden. And that made more sense um, in the past than today. So the question is how do we reform this? And one example why we need a reform is this. Aside from all the memes and remixes, you know, this is one of the greatest examples. This is the Grey album from DJ Danger Mouse who uh, grew up uh, as Knall Sparkly and before that he was a rather unknown artist called DJ Danger Mouse who took the Black Album from Jay-Z and remixed it with the White Album from the Beatles and thus created a Grey Album. An album that 2003-2004 was praised as the Album of the Year by many criti uh, critics. The problem is it has never been legally published because they didn't get the, the rights sorted out. So he ended up publishing it on the internet. Sony tried suing them. Then there was a great Tuesday when thousands of, of pages mirrored the album to to set an example and to basically show the finger to the lawyers. And after that, this album was released. It was available. It is available for posteriority, but nobody saw any money for that. Not the copyright holders, not DJ Danger Mouse. And that's one of the problems we have with remixes. And that's why rechtaufremix.org exists, a webpage we started a while ago to point out that in Germany we need a right that is partially exists in the US. In, uh, with DJ Danger Mouse it didn't work because of commercial endeavor, but in the US there is a fair use principle which makes it possible based on the US constitution to use uh, copyrighted works for political works, for educational works, and so on, create remixes and then republish them, make them available to others. Whereas in Germany, everything regarding remixes and, and modifications are illegal from the start. We want to change that because the European Union Directive on Copyright Law will be reformed very soon. We even have a special site um, to explain to the older audience <coughs> what remixing means. It's uh, museum.rechterremix.org where we explain that remixing is a tradition that is more than 100 years old. That remixes actually came up with the first forms of media. And another problem with copyright law is who of you has an ebook reader or reads ebooks? Okay, that's fewer than I thought. I thought more people in Germany would read ebooks if ebooks didn't have one problem. You probably haven't looked at the uh, terms and terms of condition terms and conditions of uh, most ebooks. So they have TNC, uh, which is different than normal books. And these ebooks that normally cost as much as a printed book, they put terms in that basically forbid everything that's not explicitly out. So you're not allowed to copy it. You, uh, I mean, most people don't do that anyway. It's also usually DRM. You can't resell it. You can't gift it. You can basically only use it on your own computer or ebook reader and even that can be prevented. Funny enough, Amazon did that once with their Kindle platform. They published um, distributed George Orwell books and there was a situation where rights were unclear which led to Amazon deleting bought versions, paid versions of 1984 from their readers overnight and uh, reimbursed the, the buyers. So it's like you go to a store, you buy a book, and then at night the the bookseller burgles your apartment, takes the book, leaves you a tenner, and goes away again. And this situation we currently have with digital works, it's not just ebooks, also music. And the big question is who is going to inherit your record record collection? So the best example of the last ten years is place for, place for sure from uh, Microsoft. iTunes was released more than ten years ago. And Microsoft wanted to to um, have their own solution. So they started a platform place for sure. That means it, it's going to play on every Windows, obviously. Uh, it suggests that it will play everywhere, but it doesn't actually work anywhere else. And then one year later, they changed the, the protection. They changed the algorithm. And they wanted everybody who purchased music in the last year to, to buy their music again. So there were huge protests. Um, they cha ended up changing it. But for 10 years, they were selling music under the label of Place for Sure. And then recently, they turned off the server because it didn't make economic sense. Everybody still bought it iTunes. And that shows the problem that 
we think we buy music, like we used to buy CDs and, and records back in the day, but actually all we do is purchase a usage license and that can be taken away at any time. So we have our record collection and we still don't know who's going to inherit it. The problem is Günther Oettinger is responsible for the copyright reform in the European Union. So as you can imagine, we don't really expect much. Maybe in the best case, uh, he's not going to make it any worse. So first off, he wants to Im in, uh, improve the copyright law by adding a uh, a protection law that even snippets will be subject to payment. There is a nice meme um, that it's been zero days since I threatened the existence of the internet made by Julia Rida. So I'm, I'm going to skip over that because Julian's going to talk about this later. So let's get to the last one. What can you do? I hope I didn't depress you too much. We're trying also at netspolitik.org to show people that these are political processes. And that means they are discussed in our society. You can actually participate. You can make your voice heard. If you just sit around and do nothing, then the lobbyists and the... Um, people they talk to get to decide and that is currently a huge part of the industry another part of what the uh, environmental movement has realized long ago is that most things are actually decisions based on, on consumption so they realized if you buy organic produce if you buy uh, regional products then that helps save the environment a little bit bit by bit. So you can do that to change, um, protect your privacy by choosing services that have privacy included and that actually value encryption and your data. So you don't have to go to WhatsApp, you can use alternatives. So please use anonymizers, use encryption technology. And the mass surveillance that's being enacted at the central exchange points is so easy because almost nobody uses encryption. Most of the large services just didn't think of it. It, it might have cost maybe 10% more CPU time, so they usually would have disabled SSL base for economic reasons. And then they were all super confused when uh, the secret services basically hacked into their data centers and started listening to all the traffic. So just through active usage, you can make it harder for the surveillance state to get everyone's data. And the more people do that, the more expensive and the harder this kind of surveillance gets. And that means the more people have to focus on, on individuals and try to decrypt their traffic if they want to find terrorists and wrongdoers. So you can do something even where you live. You can join Freifunk networks. You can help educate others. We have the luxury of sitting in uh, Berlin, where there's lots of choices of people to connect with. But you can also try to establish local infrastructure, work with other people locally, start crypto parties, explain encryption, do uh, media competency projects and, and Freifunk projects. What you can always do is contact your representatives. Far too few people do that, especially we learned in the European Union Parliament that isn't even these um, very fixed blocks that we have in the Bundestag. Most decisions are being made on the European Union level and politicians there work like in every other parliament. They are specialized in certain topics and if they sit in the commission for, for fishery and they do fishery politics all the time that really exists, then they don't really have the time to care about other topics. And that makes sense. But if they are then... Uh, be, uh, if they start being contacted by citizens that try to explain to them, hey, look, this this uh, ACTA is a big issue right now, then suddenly they're, they're confused and, and want to be informed about ACTA because so many citizens contacted them about it. So the more people try to contact their reps, the more likely it gets that we get a better, polit uh, better, better policies enacted on the European Union level but also on the um, on a national level. So then you can support open source projects to create open uh, decentralized open alternatives. I don't know how many of you have actually worked on Wikipedia. Many people like to complain about Wikipedia quality, but many people also don't realize there's an edit button that you can just click on and then put in your own changes. You don't have to code to support open source projects. Wikipedia is maybe the best example. You can be creative if you're a designer, if you're a video artist or 
any other way you can create remixes we usually have the problem that we don't have enough time to be creative but we have many ideas and we're always happy about support uh, from people outside who are really good at that but usually they uh, often have no idea what they can do then of course you can use the law you can donate that actually helps quite a lot the en environmental movement got this big because there's a few million people in Germany that actually support organizations like the World Wildlife Fund, the NABU, the, um, with enough money that they can afford professional infrastructure that enables them to participate in politics more efficiently compared to when everybody does something in their free time and then um, they start watching a new TV series and it, they're not keen on, on working in politics anymore. So finally, you never give up. All the decisions are being made now and in the coming years, and they will probably be in place for the coming generations. And everything we cannot prevent today and everything that could end up being much worse is probably going to be in place for the next generation, and it's going to be much harder to reform in a few years or in 20 years than trying to... Um, enact the, the changes right now so this was an intro and overview we'll be here for a while longer there's three more talks coming i think there's some time for questions and answers thanks for listening and thanks for being here so there's a few minutes left for questions and answers any questions So, for example, concerning Wikipedia, uh, concerning question to the roots of Wikipedia, uh, I will, if I if, if I give my uh, knowledge to Wikipedia, if I write an article as a scientist, um, I can give my knowledge to Wikipedia, but I will have to subscribe to their um copyright uh, decisions and I cannot publish it under my own name. For example, for ex mostly social scientists uh, think that what they publish uh, is their peer genius. But the Wikipedia is the is a way of many people coming together and writing uh, a common uh, text not not everybody can deal with this situation but but from from a general standpoint it makes sense that a lot of great minds come together and publish this text together and they control it so in the end we'll have a as neutral as possible text which would bet would be better than everybody just publishing their own text so that's that's a big difference um, that's also a question in open access. For example, scientific books can be published freely, uh, but literary literary uh, scientists uh, give it away not as likely as um, scientists, for example, from natural sciences. I want to say my uh, I have the same opinion. But I have a problem that the guys uh, who control and um, um, actually edit Wikipedia articles do not have this knowledge, and these are the wrong guys uh, editing it. So it should be civil engagement, engagement uh, of a lot of people coming together, a lot of people read Wikipedia, and much more people should also... Uh, uh, work with Wikipedia because a lot of people don't even know about uh, how the system works and they should not only consume Wikipedia but they should also support the work of Wikipedia but we as a society we have to come together much more and we have to uh, empower this uh, kind of voluntary digital work this work of Wikipedia is a, is highly qualified voluntary work but if you do this work uh, you will be looked down upon as from society as somewhat of a freak or a nerd
So thank you for your um, thank you for your presentation. I have a question concerning Tor. And but now we have seen reports that Tor traffic is also being monitored and gets special treatment, of course, from some agencies, from some secret agencies, and governmental uh, agencies also. Uh, providing Tor notice for bad ends. Do you think we can still trust protocols like Tor? Would you still recommend it to friends? Yeah, I would. I know lots of people that know lots more about the technology behind Tor, who all use Tor for, for these reasons, that they do trust this infrastructure more, even taking into account all the possible problems, than the public internet. So lots of people think there's so much traffic on the internet, mine isn't even going to make a blip in the radar. But no, even if there's so much data going through the networks, it is so easy now to analyze the data at scale and to whittle it down to any individuals. Using Tor makes it harder. So yeah, it, it is a game of cat and mouse. Tor is a hidden network that is being routed through through layers of clouds of onions and the exit nodes, exit service and nodes uh, in, in Tor, we have a shortage of. So there are initiatives like the Friends of the Onion or the CCC who run an exit nodes financed through donations from the public. And that actually helps many people also in other countries or repressive regimes to use their right to um, free speech and, and voicing their opinion. And they actually need to use this kind of infrastructure because their internet access is actually being censored and they are in mortal danger for doing things that we here take for granted. We have two more questions, please. I have a question concerning... I've seen a couple of those presentations also two of yours presentations and basically the quintessence is we have to do something urgently but it doesn't resonate with a lot of people in general society there are much too few listeners and there are other topics that attract much more attention that get a lot of much more people on the streets and demonstrations TTIP demonstrations have have also happened, but I didn't see it uh, coming big topic in society. Uh, it's not comparable to the um, to saving the environment. So but TTIP is not a good not a good example because the biggest demonstration oh. and the, the, the biggest public protest in the last few years has been the TTIP protest in Berlin. So I think it is the topic has actually arrived in the center of society, but politics don't really listen in. And the thing is, if many people don't go and vote, then uh, the the older generation gets to decide and they support TTIP. But uh, a, a different side is that if we look at the history of the environmental movement, that we have a similar state like the environmental movement before Chernobyl. Because before that, they, they were the long-haired freaks. They they weren't really um, anywhere near the center of society, except maybe for the southwest of Germany where people were afraid of uh, nuclear plants in the neighborhood. But we have a, a digitization or a, a wave of digitization where 10 years ago, large parts of the populace were hoping that this too shall pass. And since then have been busy trying to figure out their smartphones and sooner or later these people will realize that they are affected and the environmental movement 30 years ago no one would have thought that in 2013 or, or whenever the govern the german government will pro will, will declare their the exit from nuclear power or that environmental protection would be um one of the basic tenets of the government. So maybe we're just waiting for the, the big catalyst. There's also the special interest debates whether the uh, Snowden revelations are comparable to Chernobyl. Some people say, yeah, because it's such a big thing, and others say, uh, no, maybe the Snowden revelations are only comparable to what happened before Chernobyl. Some Iranian 
um, nuclear scientists reveals nuclear power plants, plant plants, and the specialists know, oh, there's a big problem, but the rest of the population only realized when uh, Chernobyl blew up. So maybe, maybe it needs a even bigger catalyst, uh, huge data leaks that are just a question of time. So at Netzpolitik, we can barely keep up with the new um, new data leaks that have happened every day. 100 million here, 100 million there. So what if the da Google's database with everything you've done and searched for in the last few years is suddenly available online, connected with your name? Maybe then more people will be uh, aware of these, these issues. And so it, it might just be a waiting game. We're not going to give up because we know that it needs much more time because parts of the population have only now start to realize that they are part of the digitization and haven't put enough thought about it, what that means for them and their personal lives because they're still completely overwhelmed by them finding themselves being part of this suddenly. Okay, I personally use WhatsApp and Threema on my cell phone and since a few months uh, WhatsApp is also, uh, has also incorporated end-to-end -end encryption do you think we can trust that? Well there's, there's uh, different theories about this so first off it shows how important connected data is if uh, Facebook as the WhatsApp owner can use can make more use of the information who you communicated with and when and where to create more profiles about your person then from the content. The other question is, there's uh, some theories that they only did that so they wouldn't have to answer all the, the queries from authorities because that that um, actually costs them money. I still think that there's some sort of central key or there might be some sort of central key so that it's better than before when everything was unencrypted going over the wire and everybody could listen in that now instead you have some sort of transport security but I personally would not entrust my communication to a Facebook encryption that nobody I know or trust because they are knowledgeable about this has looked at okay thanks Marcos and you're probably going to be around for a while here up next is Anna Viselli, a colleague of Marcos from Netspolitik.org. And she's going to talk a lot more about surveillance and much more competent than I could. Ah, and we have stickers up here uh, next to the headphones. So get your mile supplies last.